Quite frankly, this is one of the most challenging free response questions that you'll encounter. And I think that's for two reasons. One, just the sheer breadth of information that you're going to find useful tells us something about how many different topics are covered in this question. And secondly, the curious nature of the function g of x, namely, it's given as a sort of hybrid function. On the one hand, we've got a part that's given in symbolic form, which is straightforward enough, but we also have a part that's given in integral form, and yet the function at the heart of the integral is given geometrically. So, without further apology, let's jump in and see what sense we can make of this. Part A wants to know g of negative 3. Well, that's really just asking us to plug in a negative 3 wherever we see an x. So, 2 times negative 3 plus an integral from 0 to negative 3 of f of t dt. Uh, well, 2 times negative 3 is easy enough. That's negative 6. And now we have to find the signed area of this region. But we have to realize that we're going in the in negative direction in the evaluation of the integral. And so even though this would normally be given a positive signed area, we're going to have to bring it in in a negative fashion. Now, what's the area of this? It's 1 quarter of a circle. The radius is clearly 3. The area of a circle is pi r squared. When 3 is involved, it's going to be 9 pi. But because it's just a quarter of it, we subtract 9 pi over 4. That's our answer. Next, we're looking for g prime of x. Well, the derivative of a function that is two different functions added together is simply adding together the two derivatives. So the derivative of 2x is just 2. And from our understanding of the fundamental theorem, the derivative of this expression is simply f of x. Now, evaluating that at negative 3, we have 2. And let's think about uh, that f of negative 3 is 0. So that takes care of part A. Part B, where is the absolute maximum? Justify your answer. Maximum for g. <clears throat> well, we need to we need to check both the endpoints as well as local maxima on the interior. Okay, so we may as well get started. First, we need to find g at negative 4. That's going to be 2 times negative 4 plus the integral from 0 to negative 4 of f of t dt. 2 times negative 4 is obviously negative 8. And then this integral from 0 to negative 4 involves combining two signed areas. This first one we already learned was 9 pi over 4. But again, because we're calculating the integral in the reverse direction, we're going to subtract off 9 pi over 4. And the integral from 3 to negative 3 to negative 4 will involve negative signed area because we're working again in the reverse direction we'll have to add that area in. That's one quarter of a circle with radius 1 
pi times 1 squared over 4. So that's just going to be plus pi over 4. Let's go on. We found it at the one end point. We need to find it at the other end point, g of 3. g of 3 is going to be 6 plus the integral from 0 to 3 of f of t dt. Again, we look at the geometric shape here. And while we could calculate this positive signed area and then negative signed area, if you notice, these are exactly symmetrical areas and of opposite sign right through the center at uh, x equals 1.5. And so this entire integral is going to be a net 0. So g of 3 is, in fact, just 6. Okay, we found it at the two endpoints. What about where the uh, local maxima occur in the interior of this interval? Well, local maxima occur uh, where f prime changes sign from plus to minus as you move left to right. So let's just write that out. In this case, our f prime is g prime. Changes from plus to minus as we go left to right. So where does that happen? That's going to occur where 2 plus f of x changes from being greater than 0 to being less than 0. Okay, And 2 plus f of x is equal to 0 right when f of x is negative 2. So where is f of x negative 2? Looks like right about here. I think you can see that from the line. That's going to be right where x equals 5 halves. So that means we need to also calculate g of 5 halves. That's going to be 2 times five halves, which is five, plus we have to find the value of this integral from zero to five halves. And the positive area that's added in, one half times 3 halves times 3, that's going to be 9 fourths. And then how much do we lose as we go from 1 and a half to 2 and a half? That's 1 half 1 times negative 2. That's going to be minus 1. So that's itself 5 fourths. So our final answer is 5 plus 5 fourths. Okay? So our choices come down to these three possibilities. 6 and a quarter, 6, and this number which you can quickly see is negative. And so the conclusion is that the absolute max occurs at 
x equals 5 halves. Quite a bit of work there. This part C is a little easier. We just need to find where uh, points of inflection occur. Points of inflection occur where the second derivative of the function changes sign. So let's just say points of inflection occur where g double prime changes sign. And g double prime of x is the same as the derivative of this, which is going to be f prime of x. So the question is, where does f prime of x change sign? Well, the derivative of f is really the slope of this curve, which is positive here, undefined right here, but it continues on positive here. So there's no change in sign. There is a change in sign, however, right here. Okay. namely from positive to negative. Okay. F prime of x changes sign at x equals 0 only. And we see that from the graph. Okay, so finally on to D, the mean value theorem and why it doesn't apply. First, let's find the average rate of change of f. Now notice, for this part only, we're only talking about the function f, no longer talking about g. Thank goodness. So the question is, where does, what do, is the average rate of change of f over this interval? Okay, well that's easy enough. We're just going to say that the average rate of change of f equals uh, f at 3 minus f at negative 4 all over 3 minus negative 4. Average ROC therefore equals uh, f of 3 is negative 3 minus f of negative 4 that's minus a negative 1 all over 7 so negative 2 over 7 okay all right now they assert and we're not going to question their assertion that nowhere in this interval is the slope equal to negative two-sevenths. And why doesn't that contradict the mean value theorem? Well, to contradict the mean value theorem, the mean value theorem would have to apply. There are conditions for it to apply. It has to be continuous on the closed interval. It has to be differentiable on the open interval. Well, this function is clearly continuous as I could draw this curve without ever lifting up my pen in the colloquial sense, but it is not differentiable on the open interval. Namely, the derivative doesn't exist here, and because we've got a corner, because we have an, uh, an infinity, and that because we have a corner, the derivative doesn't exist here either. Okay, So the real point is the mean value theorem is not contradicted because it doesn't apply. MVT is not contradicted because it does not apply. And our reason for that is f of x is not differentiable at x equals negative 3 or x equals 0. Quite a bit in that problem.